Hello, my name's David Ronfeldt, and I'm here to talk about T-I-M-N, an acronym that stands for Tribes, Institutions, Markets, and Networks. It's a framework I'm working on about social organization and evolution. Look, the background story is, is simply this. Somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, I started doing some reading and writing about the information revolution and quickly learned that it favors network forms of organization. Networks were going to be a very big deal. But then I wondered, relative to what? What other major forms are out there? Again, it was easy to come up with hierarchies and markets, since there's a lot of literature on that, or institutions and markets. And so in the startup phase, I had I plus M plus N, but it felt like something was missing. So I started doing some more reading. There, there had to be an earlier form. And I learned about tribes. So that's how we ended up with T for tribes, I for institutions, M for markets, and N for networks. Again, here's a slide that, that, that shows these, these four forms. So let's just quickly acknowledge that all four concepts are really quite unsettled, even controversial. Anthropologists don't like the term tribes, but that doesn't stop them from talking about clans and kinship networks and other things that are really tantamount to tribes. Uh, many academics define institutions much more broadly to include any sort of repeated pattern of activity. Marriage becomes an institution. But I'm, uh, I'm using the definition that refers to hierarchical organizations. Economists and others pretty much conflate markets and capitalism. You talk about one, you mean the other. But in this framework, is about markets. Capitalism is a particular way of approaching markets. And I, if you look at the slide again, you'll see that markets are actually the, the most difficult of the four forms to, to depict. But, but that's the way it goes. And then fourthly, as to networks, I'm up against the view that, uh, well, that there are really two views. Uh, network science, social network analysis, tend to regard everything, all forms of organization, as reducible to networks. I prefer the approach that it's a distinct form of organization, different from tribes, hierarchies, and markets, that's only now finally coming into its own. So we're going to persist with there being just four forms, and that they're more than mere forms. Here's a slide uh, to that effect. Sometimes I'm asked whether there is another form beyond these four. Well, note on the slide toward the bottom that the rise of each form is dependent on its own information revolution. Tribes arose with the oral storytelling information revolution. Hierarchies with print so you could keep records and issue written commands. Markets didn't really take off until you had the electrical revolution. Telephones, telegraphs, telexes. And of course, the rise of the network form is tied to the digital information revolution. So if there is another form beyond these four, there's going to have to be yet another information revolution. From what I've said, and from what I'm going to get into next, TIMN is probably worth a book, short book, but I doubt that at the rate I'm going, the things will get done. But if you're interested, there is a collection of papers. Don't wait for the book. But if you're interested, don't wait for the book. Take a look at some papers and some blog posts that I've done. 
And we'll put up a slide at the very end that lists some of those. Okay, so TIMN is basically a story about getting these four forms added up, combined, in a particular progression. And here's a slide that sort of outlines that, and the steps from going from what I might as well call monoform, tribe-only societies, to quadriform societies, T plus I plus M plus N. As I started to think about this, I, I, I gathered that nobody had quite looked at social evolution quite this way. Uh, usually people did it in a standard way, uh, talking about one or two of the forms, say, going from tribes to states. Again, they do it in a very detailed way that would muster all kinds of economic, technological, cultural factors that would just get piled up. But the more I started reading about these four forms, again, their histories, the more it seemed to me that I'd spot propositions about one form that I could, that could be applied to the other form. In other words, there were some general system dynamics going on here. Again, here's a slide that speaks to that. Again, roughly, as you can see from the propositions I've identified so far, bad guys learn how to use these forms as early, if not earlier, than do the good guys. For example, warlords build up their early state hierarchies. Pirates and smugglers sort of get a hold of the market form early on. And now, of course, we're up against transnational terrorists and criminals who've been pioneering the network form. But the good guys learn too. Whether it's the good guys or the bad guys, subversive effects happen before the additive effects. The rise of each of these forms has very disturbing effects on the old order. But in time, and we're talking decades, if not centuries, the new form not only takes hold, but a sector, an entire sector of activity, if not a new realm of activity, is built around it. States, market capitalism, uh, as you can sense. Again, as this new sector grows, it modifies all of the old sectors. Vast rebalancings and strengthenings have to take, have to occur. So, in short, TIMN becomes a story about complexity, like most other theories of evolution. But I hasten to add, it's also a story about increasing simplicity. Most theories of evolution posit ever increasing complexity. Today's collapsitarians and apocalyptics take this complexity to the breaking point where you end up collapsing and starting all over. This is not so with the TIMN progression. Yes, there's increasing complexity, but the addition of each new form re-simplifies things too because the new form takes over and supports activities that were being done badly by the old form. Complicatedness gets corrected, but complexity increases through this simplification. So that's one overall point I wanted to make. The second overall point is that TIMN does have a bias a theoretical bias that's also a philosophical and ideological bias. And that's in that it favors keeping these forms as having separate realms of activity, being aware of the limits of what each form or realm can accomplish, keeping them in balance and coordinated, all four of them. In that sense, it's kind of Parsonian for Talcott Parsons, kind of Weberian 
for Max Weber. A bit Marxist, but at times I even think it's maybe even a bit Buddhist because of the emphasis on harmony and balance. Okay, so we have a framework built around four forms and a handful of propositions that amount to general system dynamics. Again, there's probably another handful or two of propositions out there that I'm still looking for. So listen, TIMN is not something that I'm inventing. I'm not trying to invent a theory that doesn't exist. I rather feel like I'm uncovering something that already exists, has long existed, but is only now noticeable. This kind of thing couldn't be noticed until there were three or four forms around to start identifying. So in a sense, TIMN is an exercise in futurology, but based on what I just said, it's also an exercise in archaeology. That's the way I'm approaching it anyway. But in addition to being potentially useful for thinking about the past and the future, TIMN is also quite relevant, I think, for dissecting current events and current trends in what's happening around the world. Myself, I keep trying to notice what's happening to or with each of the forms as an event unfolds, say as a politician announces his political platform. TIMN recommends being somewhat suspicious if only one form is being addressed in a way that might un be out of balance with the other forms. For example, when anarchists keep longing for a return to tribal origins, or libertarians go mad for market solutions to just about everything. In effect, then, I keep searching for ways that we might get from our current triformist approaches to our civilizations on to the next phase of quadriformist approaches that involve the network form. Now, a lot's happening with the network form these days, but one of the most interesting is the surge of protest movements from Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street around the world. So let's talk about that a little bit next. So let's talk about the protests and their implications for, for a few minutes. I, I find them particularly interesting as an expression of the plus N network form and how it may evolve in, in the future. Now the protests are particularly exciting because they fulfill, in my view, a lot of the work that uh, John Arquilla and I did uh, some years ago about networks, net wars, swarming, and new politique. But as we look ahead, what about the effects and implications of all this activity in uh, tomorrow, in the long tomorrow? For TIMN, everything hinges on pivots off the rise of the network form. Is all this talk about networks, does it all just mean that networks are a modifier of everything else that's going on? Many people seem to think so. They talk about network tribes, networked hierarchies, networked markets. We get networks, but they don't know quite what to do with it. With it. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out too. So is it just a modifier, or is it truly a cardinal form in its own ways, in its own right? TIMN says so. If so, again, if a new sector is therefore going to take shape around it, different from today's public and private sectors, for example, then this new sector is going to have to do something solve problems that the other sectors 
have not done well enough at. In fact, problems that the other sectors may have even created. Indications that this has been happening, that, uh, that I've spotted, uh, come from a lot of the new activity in civil society by nonprofit organizations, for benefit organizations, non governmental organizations that are operating in sprawling networks that are giving them a lot of new strength relative to other actors. Now, this has been noticed. For, for quite some years by now, particularly by people who've talked about the rise of a third sector, that's one term, or a social sector, that's another term, that with an emphasis on volunteer and charitable work. But I think a lot more than that's going on. And some people are noticing it. It's not being noticed much on the right side of the political spectrum. I see very little thinking there about the implications of the new network form, except as a modifier of everything else. One thinker who is taking the lead is in England, Philip Blond, of an outfit called Res Publica, who's emphasizing associations, not so much networks as associations, that he thinks can be doing a lot more to rebalance. Uh, relations in favor of civil society. Some people on the right are also talking about a concept of stewardship. Stewardship keeps coming up that I think will fit into this picture, but they haven't linked it to networks yet. Most of the interesting thinking about the future of the network form is occurring on the left, a particular segment of the left that's interested in peer-to-peer -peer relationships, P2P. And what they're focusing on is the commons. And they're proposing the rise of a new common sector that will include not only the traditional physical commons, but also the knowledge, cyberspace, knowledge, information commons. And they've got some very in my view, exceedingly ambitious notions of how far this can go, uh, involving vast restructurings of society in, in, in ways that uh, the left would be much happier with. Now, my own view is still very tentative, uh, and I, I can't be, I'm far from being precise about it, but my thoughts are running continue to run in this direction. I think the left is on to something about the commons. But I think a word like common wheel or common wealth is, is more what it's about. Uh, I have a sense that a lot of health, education, and welfare activities that the state has performed, that the market keep, actors keep talking about privatizing. I think that many of those might be better off migrating into this network sector. We'll see. And of course, environmental issues figure in this as well. Whatever the specific issues, the rise of this network sector will depend even more than the other sectors on the development of vast sensory apparatuses not just for surveillance from the top, but also sous-valence from the bottom that can do a lot of monitoring and watching about what's going on in society. So I've been particularly pleased recently with a new addition to my thinking, which is the concept of monetary democracy, as proposed by a, a uh, a philosopher John Keane. That concept, as I understand it uh, so far, is very much about the rise of civil society actors. He doesn't talk about networks much yet, but I believe he will increasingly, that scrutinize and watch and generate policy inputs. 
his basic theme is that we've gone from a distant era of assembly democracy to a modern era of representative democracy, but that they're running out of steam. And what's next is monetary democracy, because the key actors for democracy come out of these, uh, come out of civil society. What's missing in all this still is a sense of if this as this new tech sector takes shape, of how are all these activities going to get aggregated? Where are the aggregations going to occur and what kinds of organizations? Clearing houses. And who's going to pay for it? Uh, my own hunch is, is, uh, is that we'll be developing new systems of micropayments that will enable this new realm. And along the way, my further hunch is that we're going to see a shift in emphasis from rights to responsibilities. We've been through decades now of activities about rights. We need something new about responsibilities. And I think some of that's implicit even in these uh, protest movements. Okay, so that's kind of where my thinking stands at this point. Uh, two quick final implications. One is that we are nowhere near the end of history. New systems, new ideologies are going to be taking shape. The challenge is not to become better at being a liberal or a conservative. The challenge is how to move from being a triformist to a quadriformist. The end of history framework is basically triformist. We need to get beyond that, and we will. My final point is, 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 is kind of abstract. I think embedded in, in all of this, possibly, is a mathematics of social evolution. That maybe we could take those sketchy T plus I plus M plus N formula, you can actually turn it into specific indicators and mechanisms about relationships among them that would enable some kind of mathematics of social evolution where we can develop indexes of how well societies are doing in terms of that index. Anyway, that's a, that's a speculative ambition. So that's it. And I thank you for uh, I thank you for being interested.